He immediately wanted to say something. Kids hide your eyes, but it was too late. One of them said, look, Dad, those people are not wearing helmets. <laughs> they were concerned on safety, and uh, they were really focused on it. So today, as we move into our study, St. Paul is really focused on reaching out to these people in Corinth, this church in Corinth. Uh, with a message of hope. Despite all the distractions, he wants people to know that uh, these opponents have brought on the distractions. It's not the Word of God that has done that, and it's not their relationship. Paul had gone on his third missionary journey after he left Corinth, and during that time, others came in to the congregation as leaders and they questioned, who was this Paul, and what kind of a message was he leaving here anyway? He forgot some of the most important parts of the message, was, was to keep the Jewish Torah rules and regulations. And so they were attacking him as being light on understanding. Well, you know, Paul, before he became a Christian, was what? Not just a Pharisee, but a Pharisee of Pharisees. I mean, he was the top dog, and if you want to add rules and regulations, he knew every one of them and practiced them all. And yet, uh, when he heard the gospel, he realized those reg regulations uh, were not the part that God wanted us to continue, but rather the good news of Jesus. And so, instead of having his own agenda, these with false ideas brought their agenda and tried to mix the two. And Paul was saying, no, it's faith alone, and uh, not adding rituals and other regulations to it. In present day, I don't know if you've heard about this at all, but recently, Ravi um, Zacharias has been attacked. There was an article recently, by the way, he's uh, a Christian who didn't become a Christian until he was 17 years old in a hospital. Uh, he had drunk poison. He wanted to end his life. And instead, uh, God rescued him. And at the hospital, uh, one of the nurses gave his mother a uh, Bible and told her to read John chapter 14 to him as he's lying there unable to really respond at first. And as she was reading, uh, ran across verse 19, because I live, you shall live also. And that was the words that caught his attention and caused him to seek to understand this Christian faith, which was so different from anything he had heard before. And so in 1966, he moved with his family to Canada, got his uh, Master of Divinity degree, and became active in evangelism and um, apologetics in arguing for the Christian faith. And in fact, at this time, there's 15 offices throughout the world. Uh, he's been married for 45 years to his wife, Margie. But recently, Christianity Today had an article um, that came up, Ravi Zacharias responds to sexting allegations. As you heard, that's a big thing going on at this time in our news. Seems like every one of some ilk is being uh, picked out. And I think in many cases, um, it's really been tough for these women to step forward uh, when they have someone with so much power uh, that has misuse their office or abilities. And so I don't want to demean any of the women who have stepped forward. Um, but I also want to know that occasionally there's going to be some false claims as well made. And, and that's what uh, Ravi Zacharias, according to his statement, says that uh, they released on Sunday that he was speaking at a conference in Canada back in October of 2014. And there he met a couple who expressed interest in his ministry and the wife asked him to reach out to her husband because he had questions about the Christian faith. And so Zacharias sent an email to the man and also a book. Months later, she began to contact Ravi and uh, use that email address 
that he had used to contact them, and she sent some extremely inappropriate pictures of herself, and clearly, so he clearly instructed her to stop contacting him, and he blocked her messages and resolved to terminate contacts with her. Well, in April of 17, she and her husband sent a letter uh, from their attorney demanding money from Ravi Zacharias. He immediately notified his board and got his own attorney. And uh, ultimately, the, they got together and an agreement was reached on November 17 uh, this year uh, to resolve the issue and dismiss the lawsuit. So, Ravi Zachariah has always practiced uh, physical safeguards of not being separate, alone with women. Uh, we're not his family, his wife and kids. Um, just as Billy Graham had done in his ministry. But he also realizes now that he has to extend that to digital correspondence as well. Um, that as a Christian, we're held to a higher standard and don't put yourself in a situation where you could be attacked. So in our day and age, we do realize we live in a continued spiritual warfare. And uh, Satan wants to damage our witness in Christ. If he doesn't have us, he wants to make sure we aren't able to get the word out to other people. So we need to uh, realize we often have a spiritual target on our back and be able to speak out uh, in our skeptical age. So this is, I think, an introduction to what we want to look at with St. Paul and the message he was trying to bring to the church of his day. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by meek the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am based among you. Or another way of saying it, if you have your Bible, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1, by the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. As soon as uh, we add anything to the gospel, what happens? It's not the gospel. We can uh, have uh, the gospel plus speaking in tongues, and that removes then the gospel. The gospel and good works removes the gospel. The Gospel and the Book of Mormon, the Gospel and the Watchtower, uh, the Gospel and Rituals. Whenever we put that and in there, it removes the Gospel. You see, Christ never did and never will add something to what we must do in order to be saved. He came that we might have life in his name and the forgiveness of our sins. It depends upon Christ alone. He's done everything on our behalf. What I was alluding to, uh, or going to allude to, was from your children's message today. A, a little girl went to her mother and asked, how did the human race get started? And she said, well, God created Adam and Eve, and thus we have the human race. So she goes to her dad, who was not a Christian, and she said, how did we get here? And he says, well, we evolved from monkeys. <laughs> well, the little girl thought about that, went back to her mother and said, Mom, dad, why did Dad tell me a different story? Her mom said, well, I told you my side of the family, and he told you his side of the family. <laughs> so, good job, Dave, for setting me up. <laughs> As uh, Paul was from Christ, and therefore acted like Christ, uh, but his critics had added something to that. They loved to boast about their efforts. And remember that this church was divided back in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 3, verse 4, we says, one of you says, I follow Paul, another I follow Apollos, another I follow Cephas, still another I follow Christ. And so this divided church was already having its problems. And therefore, when these Others come along now to attack Paul. He goes back to his passage, meekness and gentleness of Christ. That's what he was coming to bring to them. Um, his humility when he was face to face with them and bold when he was away. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Um, so then he said there was no more boasting about uh, human leaders and 
verse 21 of chapter 3. These false teachers apparently had a real charisma about them, a way of their personality charming people. And Paul, it's quite impressive to me that he appeared to the people rather meek and unimpressive. Um, do you ever get that when you think of reading some of Paul's letters that he was rather meek and unimpressive? And so <clears throat> it appears to me that when he spoke to them in public, he was not much of a physical specimen, nor was he able to really uh, speak his heart as well. But when he got away and started writing about it, he put a little thunder on some of the statements that he made. Uh, and that just amazed me. I, I read several commentaries about that, and that's what the assumption of all of us at this time in life are that he was a much better writer and here he's the real foundation of many of the points of the New Testament. Um, and so he comes off as a humble and gentle person. Uh, he's, but wasn't meek or weak rather as far as uh, physically goes. I mean look at what he went through. He shipwrecks and all kinds of beatings, and yes. Well, that's very interesting to me because I remember, I don't remember exactly where, but where it talks about how he, he would get up on, in public and he'd argue with the Pharisees. Yeah, so Mars he, Hill and all that. another case where he is to these people what he needs to Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, he was arguing with them. He, in the arguments. Yes. And, you know, straightforward. Mm-hmm. But I guess he wasn't a big person about that or something, uh, didn't gloat in his things. I guess I could have flipped through a few things. Uh, we'll get back to that in a little bit. Uh, Jesus describes the way he was acting in public as well in verse, chapter 11, verses 28 and 29 of Matthew. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So when Jesus tells us to learn from him, he points out two words, gentle and humble. Um, so Paul apparently, when he would speak to these folks, uh, wasn't trying to get into a fight with them, but rather brought the message in humility and weakness. Uh, so he put into practice Christ's teachings. When you think about it, a wild horse is not a lot of use to you unless it gets trained, but it's got tons of power. What happens when it gets trained? still has tons of power. It's just redirected uh, to serve someone rather than to uh, simply show its wildness or power. And so uh, that's what is trying to be spoken of here. Um, this phrase we've heard in other settings, if you think meek is weak, try being meek for a week. Um, think about that. The, Paul came not to lord it over the people or to say, I demand you to follow me type of a format, but rather uh, apparently in the quietness of his teachings was helping people discover what the word of God really was. While the group that came in after him was making attacks against him. Um, and I think about Christ at his trial, what did he say? He was silent. He had every reason to state that the witnesses were lying, that the case shouldn't even be considered, but instead in silence, he went and carried out his mission and ministry. And so uh, apparently that's the way Paul was attempting to bring these people from um, non Christians into the faith uh, through meekness and serving them. 
when you think about it, how does, I mean, you and I are supposed to be carriers of good news to our neighbors and friends, and what stops us? We don't want to get into an argument with them. Um, we don't want to put a barrier between us. And so, in deference to that, we oftentimes just remain silent about the truth. And we need to continually discover how God can help us show the meekness and gentleness and yet the love that the gospel carries with it uh, in a way to touch hearts and transform lives. Uh, we need to do that quickly. The time's coming. We keep living in this last days time period. So uh, it's really something that should be on our hearts and minds. Well, let's move into our reading for today from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and especially verses uh, 1 through 6. Would someone care to read those for us? Now I, Paul, myself urge you by the goodness and gentleness of Christ, I commend face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent. I ask that when I am present, I may not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. All right, thank you. So what does he say? We have weapons to use, but we don't use the weapons that the world uses. Uh, what are some of those weapons that the world uses? Get them. That's right. This uh, Another translation of it is this. I hope I won't need to show you when I come with harsh and rough, how harsh and rough I can be. This is from the Living Bible. I don't want to carry out my present plans against some of you who seem to think my deeds and words are merely those of an ordinary man. It is true that I am an ordinary, weak human being, but I don't use human plans and methods to win my battles. I use God's mighty weapons, not those made by men, to knock down the devil's strongholds. These weapons can break down every proud argument against God and every wall that can be built to keep men from finding him. With these weapons, I can capture rebels and bring them back to God and change them into men whose heart's desire is to obedience to Christ. I will use these weapons against every rebel who remains after I have first used them on you yourselves and you surrender to Christ. So that's apparently how Paul came off as a weak or meek type of person. Uh, he wasn't there to lord it over them and to make demands upon them. You know, decoys, um, they are impressive sometimes. Have you ever in, been in the Midwest driving on some roads and seen they have this shell of a car or sometimes just a painted board of a car to help you slow down and uh, obey the speed limits and rules of that area. And of course, sometimes they back it up with a real person who then pulls you over, right, if you don't follow those things. I've discovered that as well. <coughs> so Paul was saying, I'm not using decoys, or it didn't come to tear you down, or deception. Um, in fact, I understand that during World War II, one of the favorite tactics of the alloy, allies were to have wooden pictures of trucks or tanks and uh, so the enemy could put their barrage of ammunition on something where no one was and waste their time and energies on those types of things uh, since they look so good from up above. But Paul wasn't using those kind of things. He wasn't trying to manipulate people into the Christian faith. 
but he rather wanted the truth of God's word to be what shined forth, what did all the work. And so uh, through that process, then he could smash their clever arguments and point out their false doctrines. So his purpose in verse 5 um, was to build up, not tear down. And so in verse 8, we read these words. So even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building you up, rather than tearing you down, I will not be ashamed of it. So uh, his desire then was this build up for maturity instead of tearing down, which is immature. How many of you have uh, played blocks with your little grandkids, especially when they're real young? You put together a few things, and what do they come and do? <laughs> Knock them down. And it takes a few years sometimes before they want to join in on the building up part. The tearing down is easy. And they giggle about it, and so do you. Uh, you put something up, and it gets knocked down immediately. But that shows immaturity. And when they start moving on in maturity, then they start helping build up. Um, and so that's what Paul is saying here, too, that his desire was to build up this congregation, not to tear it down. And so in verse 7 and the following, uh, we continue through verse 11. If someone would care to read that. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for uh, destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening with you, frightening you with my letters. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech of no account. <clears throat> Let such a person understand that what we say by letter, when absent, we do, not, we do when present. Okay, so he says, don't be fooled by appearances. And the accusation was when Paul speaks, he's timid. When he writes, he's bold. Um, I ran across this story. A visitor to a, a zoo uh, noticed one of the keepers sobbing quietly in the corner. And so inquired about that and was told that an elephant at the zoo had died that morning. And the visitor replied, was he fond of that elephant? And the man replied, not really, but he's the chap who gets to dig the hole for the <laughs> elephant. <laughs> so don't be fooled by appearances. They can often be deceptive. Um, Paul's letters do pack a punch. And he's not much to look at, though, when he's preaching. Uh, some said he was even boring. What, remember the story of the guy falling out the window when Paul's teaching all night long. Um, so to me, that just is amazing thought to hear that God could use someone who probably didn't come off as a as televangelist to start his ministry and to build up so many people in the faith and to... Uh, move people from adamantly opposed to the Christian faith into very disciples of Jesus Christ. So what does it say about you and me? We have that opportunity to, as well. The Holy Spirit can touch us in our simpleness, in our weakness, in our inabilities to even transform another person's heart and life because of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So. Um, I say, think that's maybe a good statement for us to hear and to read in his writings for us. Verse 1, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away. Huh? Um, opponents, he didn't have that physical presence or appearance. He also says later he didn't have the eloquence of Apollos. He was kind of just ordinary. And yet God could use him mightily uh, in this ministry. So God's not impressed with outward appearances. 
but we are, sadly, aren't we? One of the classic examples is 1 Samuel 16. David was the skinny runt of the family. And finally, after seeing all of Jesse's sons and overpassing each one of them, he finally chooses David, the, the runt of the litter. Uh, and we read, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Um, let's face it, anyone can come along and tear something down, even our grandkids or kids. Uh, but uh, to, to go into areas that have never before heard the gospel, that takes so much guts, doesn't it? And the power of the Spirit to be moving us forward. Um, so his word boasting, he uses it 12 times in this letter. And what does that mean, to boast? Speak out. To list your own accomplishments. Yeah, I think it uh, tends to have a negative term, doesn't it? Uh, in the sense that I'm strong and myself. I can do this. And Paul was saying that uh, his boast has to be in Christ. In the word of God that he's placed on his heart and mind, not on his physical ability to be a strong forthcoming person. Uh, verse 13, will only glory in the task that God has given to him. Um, we, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the sphere of service God himself has assigned to us, a sphere that also includes you. <coughs> So the purpose of the gospel is not to build a Disneyland here on earth. It's to build and expand the kingdom of God that is all around us. I guess that has to lead us to ultimately say, what is our passion? Let's see, did I put one in? Yeah. Verse 18. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. What is our passion? Oh Lord, enable me to be a light carrying the message of Christ. O oh Lord, enable me to be led by your spirit to step forward into things I would rather not do. Are there things that bother us that we don't do that we feel kind of guilty about and that we need to be doing. And how do we move from quietness to a boldness, not on ourselves, but on Christ? We're coming to the end of this year, and how do we get the word to San Lorenzo Village that there's a place you can meet Jesus right here. Uh, I know the Bethlehem Express is coming. Are we getting the word out to the neighborhood that they're invited to participate, to be a part of it? Um, are we doing the same thing for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day? Any ideas? How can we be used by God to be a force of victory that Paul talks about in his statements. Yes, sir. Well, just another thing about Paul somewhere, I don't, I don't know where it's at, but it talks about him having some sort of um, a thorn in his flesh and that and, and his yes. faith was always in high weakness, he was strong. Mm -hmm. And then God, you know, well, they laid that on him that he would not to rely on himself, not to think that he's the one that's doing it. Mm -hmm. In his weakness, God is using him in a mighty way. Yes, very good. And do we uh, look for our weaknesses and say, Lord, this is one I'm giving to you to use me somehow. I know many churches are questioning the same thing that we have as we look and see that our young people are not here. And uh, 
feel almost the inability to bring him. How do we do this? How do we do ministry in 2017? Yes, ma'am. Uh, one thing I think we fail to some degree on is the time we spend praying about these things. <coughs> yes. That's... Yeah, excuse me. I think we're probably all guilty, but we as a church don't set a lot of time aside to just simply pray for the needs of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I'll try to help lead us in that way better. Thanks. But also, we can do that on our own, too. I mean, day in and day out, we need to be asking God for guidance. And how do we get the word out? Uh, it should be on our prayer list each and every day. Years ago, we did something, I think it was called For Pete's Sake. Uh, it was where you really prayed about one individual. And then mm -hmm. that individual, you, you, know, you really tried to befriend and, and uh, Use the resources at hand. You know, we already have that prayer group on Wednesday at, at like 30. Mm -hmm. The praise, and, um, by joining that, that would be helpful mm -hmm. as far as... Uh, More prayer warriors here. One of the stories that really touched my heart years ago was uh, at Good Shepherd where we had a 
had put a sign up at the corner that we could change the message on. And one day, a uh, eight-year-old girl with her parents were driving by, and she said to her parents, who is God? Because it had something about God on it. And uh, parents said, I don't know. Let's find out next week. Or Sunday, this Sunday, whenever it was. I can't remember what part of the week it was. And anyway, so she brought, this eight-year-old brought her parents, and eventually they came, became regular members of the congregation. So, I mean, it's simple things. I'm sure I started with prayer. Someone was praying that God would get the word out, and this little girl took it to heart. Um, we have, as you said, a number of kids coming in and out of here and on a regular basis. How do we help them start asking questions of mom and dad? Yes? I was just wondering, with Bethlehem Express coming on Friday, is, is, is that something going to go on like on the prayer explaining? Because um, that goes to a lot of people who don't come to church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know how it worked, so <laughs> I understand I'm in it. I'm just saying, you know, invite your friends, something nice, you know. Yeah, that's a, a good point. Put that on our notes for Tuesday morning. Everyone is on Facebook. It is on Facebook. It is? Are you posted on Facebook? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can post on Facebook. And you get to Facebook by joining Facebook. Okay. okay. I actually put it on the uh, San Lorenzo community page. Oh. And I also just put it out on general. Okay. Us uh, from another generation struggle with some of that stuff. <laughs> You don't. <laughs> I might have garlic, then you would care. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, I uh, was just impressed about chapter eight on the methods that Paul of Paul reveals to us that God wanted us to know about in the fact that Paul, an ordinary guy, called with an extraordinary faith, transformed a section of the world uh, in his lifetime and felt just such a passion that he couldn't stay still, had to keep moving on, and then would write back to churches when they ran into troubles of how to be church and would help them get back in, in line once again. And I just pray that God will use us as ordinary Christians to seek ways that his glory and our good is shine forth to others. Uh, the church is not made to be an institution or a solid rock right where it is, but it's supposed to be a field. That's the way it's spoken of, that the seed goes forth, and when you throw seed forth, can see that it grows. I've got a bunch of seeds on the roof of my car, however, that will not grow. <laughs> the other, I don't know, this last week we had those little white things all over the place uh, with seeds. They were blowing around and my car got caught with them and so those I'm sure are not going to do much fruit for that tree, but they uh, continue to remind me I should wash my car sometime. Um, but that's the expectation is we don't want that seed to fall on rock or not be oppor have opportunities to settle in and grow. So uh, shall we close for today? Gracious God, this word you've given to us is powerful. We know what it's done in our own lives, removed our own skepticism, 
And as Dave was talking about today in the children's message, uh, so many people are walking around and living in this beautiful world you've made and yet have no idea on its origin and what's behind it all. And it seems like when we use human wisdom to try to discover the truths, we end up further from the truth. And so we would pray, O Lord, that uh, at this time of the year especially, you might be urging and nudging uh, family, friends, neighbors, people we can meet now and maybe can meet more in the future, to know of your love and grace and what Christmas is about because of the joy we have in knowing Christ. And so, Lord, uh, expand our vision. Expand us to see how we might, first of all, in prayer, humble ourselves before you and then <coughs> become bold in our carrying out of the passion within our hearts, that your good and gracious will might be done and our eyes of faith might be strengthened in that process as well. As that happens, Lord, and may you be glorified. We, as we go today, we thank you that we can go in your power and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming. Next week, I'll fat face try to... Uh,